Hello watch enthusiasts and welcome to this week's episode of the Watch Chronicler podcast. In today's episode we'll be looking at movements and all things watch movements from Japan, Switzerland and Germany. Of course these are the great, uh, the great powers in the watchmaking world with a very different style between them, whether it's the Japanese approach which is particularly clean and often quite minimalistic, the Swiss approach which has a very classic latitude design, or the German approach which again has a very different look and something which I'll address in this podcast. And so I'll be looking at the variations between these different pieces and what buying a watch from each country at each price range means for the movement you'll be finding within it. So there's all that to look forward to in today's episode. Before I begin, remember to like, share and subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. And remember that you can watch it on other platforms, whether that's SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes or any other host of podcasts. Also remember to head over to the watchchronicle.com website to be able to read all the latest articles, including some pieces about uh, the best Omega Speedmasters, as well as an interesting consideration about what the, uh, the interesting development is within Breitling to create the new Chronomat, which I think is the single most important watch they've released in recent memory. This week's episode is sponsored by Araj, the maker of unique watches for those who relish detail and innovation at a sensible price, but more about that later. Of course, the movement of a watch is the heart of a watch, it is the centre of the way it functions, how it works, and the general interaction an owner will have with the timepiece, whether that's when you first open the box, or when you've been wearing it for years. And so it is important to consider what you're actually going to be able to enjoy from different countries. Of course, there is huge generalisation here, because each country has developed differently and continues to develop differently, with very different philosophies appearing in these countries. But I think, firstly, the part of the industry in general which I have to look at is the more affordable area. Now, I don't mean uh, really truly affordable pieces in terms of, um, of being maybe only about £100 or less. I mean affordable in terms of pieces which are regularly purchased by people with fairly reasonable average incomes from the, the authorised dealers around the world. So I'm talking really between uh, let's say £100 and £7,000, that sort of area. And first looking at Switzerland as the benchmark, really Switzerland for a lot, for a great number of years hasn't tended to deviate far from tradition. It's only been in the last few years that in-house has become important and so more brands have tried to develop their own movements. However, for the vast majority, the, uh, the, the, the underpinnings of their movements are very much rooted in tradition. And you can see why when you think that even a brand as big as Tudor was able to have some quite serious problems with new movements, like for example the GMT movement in the Tudor Black Bay GMT, which didn't really work when it was first released, and had to be patched through various um, uh, improvements to the point where now they don't, they don't seem to be any problems at all. But the movements generally seen from Switzerland are of course the ETA 2824 and the derivatives like the Salita movements and STP movements, the ETA 2892, the Velger 7750, also ETA made, the Unitas 6497, a very traditional manually wound movement often seen in uh, older Panerais, which again is also ETA made these days, and the Pissua 7001, which uh, powers quite a lot of watches which want a smaller manually wound movement, and it's a very pretty movement too. And these movements are all roughly 40 years old or older. Now the ETA 2892 did see some de development in the late 80s and early 90s, but the general underpinnings of these movements go back over 40 years. And this is, is both a good and a bad thing. On the one hand, it means that they are reliable movements on the whole, in terms of having any aspects or problems which haven't been seen yet, having been ironed out many years ago. And the product of this, of course, is that brands can very reliably and comfortably put these movements into their watches with no real worries. Now, the, the proof of the fact that these are well-tested movements is the fact that when some, some uh, manufacturers have adjusted them, they haven't worked. Like, for example, Solita, with the original SW200, which is a clone of the ETA, ETA 2824, in essence, with one extra jewel, they had a different tooth profile on some of the gears, which very quickly sheared off. And so they, they improved this with the most recent movements not having this problem. But the generally conservative attitude has the additional problem, which you have to note, which is that if there are underlying problems with these movements which haven't been rectified over the years, they do remain present. Now, 
Luckily, most of these movements are brilliantly engineered and frankly have no issues. But ironically, the most, the most popular, the ETA 2824, does actually have a, an automatic winding issue, which I've seen in at least four watches I've owned. Um, and I've owned a few, but four watches out of, let's say, 20 having the same problem uh, says quite a lot about the movement design. And the fact that they reuse these styles of movement does mean that these things tend to remain present. One other aspect of these movements and the conservative attitude at this affordable price range is the fact that it means they can make their watches at a reasonable price. Now to give you a bit of context in terms of the manufacturing cost of having a watch made entirely in Switzerland, an entirely Swiss made watch under about £2,000 tends to have the overall finishing and build quality of a watch with a mixed origin that's Swiss and other places costing about half or two thirds as much. And so this shows the fact that they do have to economise to be able to make their watches competitive. But then you do have to note the fact that a lot of brands are developing in-house movements, particularly larger brands. Uh, certainly um, brands like, for example, Omega have done a huge amount to, develop, to, to move forward. And even Rolex are developing on their, again, traditionally designed movements, which have been around for 30 years. And this is to follow new trends, to incorporate new materials and new technologies. But you can be fairly sure that these new movements are going to last another 20 years, perhaps before the next upgrade, because that's the way Swiss, Swiss manufacturing works at these sorts of price ranges. And decoration is something which is, doesn't tend to be too comprehensive on these movements, but you will see it on the most visible plates with some perlage and some striping, but it won't be that elaborate at these price ranges usually. Where Germany is concerned, there's not an enormous amount to say at this price range about their movements on the whole. This is because brands like, for example, Larco, Zinn, Junghans, etc., all use Swiss movements with little or no German changes, uh, or few German changes, to these movements. Now, they might be decorated or adjusted or assembled in Germany, but the fundamental design and construction of the components is Swiss, and that's something to bear in mind. This is also down to the fact that Germany has had a difficult time over the years, certainly within the 20th century, with a lot of their watch manufacturing tradition being lost because of, of um, being part of the Soviet Union for um, certain quite key regions to watchmaking in Germany. And so as a consequence, they haven't had that, time, that much time to rebuild in the grand scheme of things when you compare their, their development to Switzerland. So it's unsurprising that they use these workhorse movements from Switzerland. Of course, there is one exception, which is Nomos. Nomos, whilst they do use in their Alpha Calibre, for example, an almost exact remake of that Pissua 7001 movement I mentioned, these are now entirely made in Germany, um, or at least almost entirely made in Germany in terms of components, um, features, and certainly finishing too. And so they set themselves apart and have this in-house manufacturing too, and they've grown alone in this particular way in this price range, and I must say it's quite remarkable what they've achieved. But on the whole, German watches suffer also from the same price um, trouble as Swiss ones, in the sense that it's very expensive to make these things entirely in Germany. And all but one or two German case manufacturers have gone out of business in recent years. So it's not uncommon to see a lot of components for German watches coming from other parts of the world, and movements coming from Switzerland are, are no, no different, really. Looking at Japanese movements in this price range is a very interesting piece to consider indeed, an interesting segment to consider indeed, because Japanese movements vary enormously, from the most affordable Miyota 8200, for example, all the way up to some of the top-of-the-line Grand Seiko movements, and also quartz movement, it has to, it movements, it has to be said, from Grand Seiko and Citizen, which are at the absolute top of their game. Of course, some older movements do show a lack of development, and I think these are a demonstration of the fact that Japan was really only a force to be reckoned with in the world of watchmaking from the 60s onwards. And so Switzerland had roughly 50 years uh, head start. So we're seeing a lot of the features in the older 8000 or 8200 series Miyota movements, or 7S26 movements seen in the Seiko SKX, have the specifications you would have expected from a Swiss movement, a workhorse Swiss movement in the 60s. So there is a, a slight delay there, but the development in Japan has been continuous, which is a very different philosophy to Switzerland. Where Switzerland tends to be quite conservative, Japan update their movements every few years. Um, 
and this is something which does cause problems for spare parts in the long run, but the fundamental fact is the fact that you do have huge development and really very clever movements coming out. Of course, at the more affordable um, realms, you'll find very pragmatically developed movements. These are movements which use clever bidirectional automatic winding, like the Seikos, with the magic lever, and Miyota, who choose to just use a unidirectional system because it's more efficient in terms of small wrist movements because the gearing is always engaged, and also because it's much more reliable. So these are very cleverly conceived movements for that function, and actually their affordable movements are starting to give Swiss movements a run for their money, with the Miyota 90, uh, well, 9000 series being one of the best movements I've seen in years. It's a really phenomenal movement. But the development there increases the higher the price, you, uh, price range you look at. So apart from the, the efficient automatic winding, MEMS, um, the ability to make incredibly light components within Grand Seiko watches and top-of-the-line Seiko movements, has increased their power reserve. And then, of course, you have to look at their super-accurate quartz watches, accurate at their best to one second a year, which is baffling. And then, of course, spring drive, which is a, a really different way of looking at a mechanical movement, and I think very clever. A key characteristic with these movements is the fact that finishing tends to be pretty rudimentary. There doesn't tend to be much decoration on the movements themselves, perhaps some on the rotor, but below about a thousand pounds or maybe 800 pounds these days with the Seiko Presage offerings, you're not going to see very much decoration at all. And unless you go up to Grand Seiko when you're looking at that um, range, you're really not going to see very much decoration at all. When you get to Grand Seiko, they have a very particular way of striping their movements, which some people call, call Tokyo stripes, which I think is a quite fun way to play off the Geneva stripe a way of looking at things. And these movements tend, or this decoration rather, tends to be a bit broader than Swiss striping and much broader than German striping. Of course, this is a generalization because there are exceptions to the rule, but as a general trend, this tends to be the case. And where construction is concerned, these movements tend to be thicker than their Swiss or German counterparts with a, uh, a sort of uh, additive process of different layers on, on these, uh, these basic movement frameworks. And so, some of these watches do tend to be quite thick, but they tend to be built to last, which is really uh, neither here nor there. It depends what you're, what you're looking to, uh, to get the best of. And before I move on to the higher price ranges, it's also worth considering that with Japanese movements, there is still a culture of preferring Swiss movements when offered them to Japanese movements in Japan. So you see brands like Minase, for example, offering an ETA 2824 in possibly the best finished, roughly affordable, um, small brand in, in Japan because that's what the market wants. And then brands like Naoya Yahida with a, a stunning dress watch not using a, a Japanese movement in favour of an architecture based on the Velju 7750. So there is this aspect to consider. But at the higher price ranges we see even more divergence between these different countries and how they address their movements. But before I continue, here's a message from this podcast sponsor. The sponsor of this podcast is Arage a brand with a unique outlook on design and quality, and with a remarkable new movement. Their 39mm Autark offers a sculpted titanium case which angles and curves inward to gracefully cover the wrist. Its dial, available with a power reserve, large date and small seconds, all native to the in-house movement, is beautifully finished. To contrast the remarkable hands and markers, is a case available in hardened titanium to shrug off the most testing abuse. By contrast, the Omnium, with its facet-cut crystal and diamond-cut hands, is presenting gleaming 904L stainless steel for added luster. This piece represents a modern interpretation of the principles of quality, widespread production and everyday practicality professed by the visionary Bauhaus School of Design. All housing a highly developed in-house movement with a silicon escapement, Arage watches represent something truly new. Find out more at arage.com. Looking at the higher realms of watchmaking, this is in the world of the handmade watch, the truly handmade watch from start to finish, where you see watches from, for example, Patek Philippe and Vacheron Stantin, Swiss movements take a very pragmatic approach. By this I mean that not all are created equal. Whereas in some other areas, which I'll, I'll come to in a minute, there is a single standard for handmade watches. Brands like Patek Philippe, for example, have four different levels of, of craftsmanship, depending upon how much you're spending on the watch, how many complications it has, and generally what calibre of timepiece it is. 
And this is actually quite a sensible thing because it means that there is a reasonable expense spent on the watches and actually is the reason why a lot of these brands are doing so well and are so successful. Um, because business sense does matter in terms of the longevity of a brand and, and I can understand the reason why they do it. But speaking about the engineering and design behind these movements, there is a pragmatic approach behind a lot of these Swiss movements. Now, this is putting aside really extreme cases like the unbelievably thin new Piaget Altiplano Ultimate Concept and also pieces from brands which have a very experimental appearance and a very different style of watchmaking because that stands aside really from the Swiss traditional watchmaking aspect, which is what I'm looking at here. Here, movement architecture is often carried over from older designs, or at least inspired by it, even in modern and brand new movements. You see similar lateral clutch arrangement, arrangements, similar column wheel ap approaches, and similar gear trains, because there is this tradition of watchmaking at this particular level, which is very difficult to break, and in fact guarantees a certain amount of reliability and durability. Where movement architecture is concerned, there tends to be a, an approach for relative simplicity in terms of not overcomplicating the job at hand, which makes an awful lot of sense when you're considering the sheer number of parts moving in a lot of the very highly complicated models coming from the most illustrious of Swiss brands. And so, as a result, the decoration of the movements is in keeping with this, um, this approach in the sense that it, it compensates in many ways for having less spectacle built into the construction of the movement. You generally will see a thinner movement than from elsewhere in terms of the way they're constructed, the way they're designed, the way they're built. And especially with chronographs, this makes a real difference to the wear on the wrist of such a watch because of the way they are integrated together. Decoration, though, is something very important for these, these high levels of Swiss watchmaking on their movements. And of course we have Geneva striping, Côte de Genève, which is the the, uh, the traditional striped pattern you see across plates, bridges um, and cocks within a movement. And this gives a very particular aesthetic and the quality here is always going to be superb. But some aspects which tend to be more prevalent on Swiss movements than elsewhere is a rhodium finish. You will very often see rhodium finished Swiss movements. Now there are exceptions like for example F.P. Journe, although in fact he is um, of the French tradition of watchmaking so his movements are gold and that's a very old-fashioned way of making movements. But on the whole, traditional Swiss movements will be rhodium plated to give a lustrous silver finish. And this doesn't tarnish over time particularly, so you keep that very bright, very new appearance. There's also a lot of black polishing, which gives a very, very flat surface to the extent where, unless you're looking at it in direct light, you see this black surface because it doesn't have any imperfections to reflect light at you unless there is a direct light source and that's remarkable to see. This is seen elsewhere but it's particularly prevalent in Switzerland and then a feature which is also key is, is um, anglage. This is where the edges of movement plates and bridges are, uh, are beveled exquisitely and in Switzerland they will even add corners and add edges to add complexity to the job just to demonstrate this skill. And that's something generally seen on Swiss movements, which you don't tend to see from German movements, for example. Uh, and so that's a, a very clear distinction which you see. Now, some new materials are seen with the use of silicon, for example, Udmar Piguet also using new titanium alloys for springs. But generally, there is still an element of tradition around these things. And the new materials are a product of a changing industry rather than a particularly Swiss trend. Really top of the line German movements are quite an interesting comparison to Swiss movements because they're very similar in some ways and yet extremely different in others. Starting with their general construction, these movements tend to use fewer plates. Now this is something which you see on the Glassutur Regional, for example, on Arlang and Zürner and some top of the line Nomos models too, where rather than having individual plates and bridges for different functions within the movement um, or, or small cocks um, extending from the sides of the movement, to hold pieces like, for example, the escape wheel, as you see in some traditional Swiss movements, you'll often see a, a one large bridge to cover the entirety of the movement, with the exception of the balance cog. And the appearance is just thoroughly different to a Swiss approach, and particularly visible on movements which don't have features like, for example, a tourbillon or a chronograph. And the beauty of this is that it means that you have very large open spaces to appreciate the finishing of these movements, which is different too. Of course, from brand to brand it varies. A lot of brands use a traditional style of, um, of, of silvered coating, very similar to what you see from Swiss, move, Swiss movement manufacturers and brands. 
Others, however, use nickel silver or German silver, which is a nickel alloy, which isn't uh, at all silver related, but it, it tarnishes over time with a honey sort of colour, which is quite wonderful. And you see a lot of parts of these movements being made out of this, this type of material, which gives a, a lovely look, I must say, and one which a lot of people enjoy. One other aspect to consider is the fact that these movements tend to be thicker than their Swiss counterparts, as a result of a very different philosophy where complications are concerned, and where you end up with a movement with a very three-dimensional appearance. Of course, this is thoroughly beautiful to look at, and something which I think a lot of people were happy to exchange for the, uh, the thinness of the Swiss counterparts. And in many ways, we see the manifestation of an industry which has developed post uh, solid case back watches. You see a lot of Pate Philippe movements, for example, were created, or at least the philosophy was created in a period when the average customer wouldn't see the movement of their watch. It was concealed behind a gold case back. However, with these modern German brands, their entire existence has been in the world with these exhibition case backs for high horology pieces. And so naturally their approach to watchmaking is different, which I think is very interesting and adds real, um, real wonder to the industry in terms of having different approaches to the same function. Where finishing is concerned, apart from the different finish, uh, finish on the surface of the movements, the decoration is different too. We tend to see less perlage than on a Swiss movement and more finishes with a narrower style of striping, glasseuter striping as some people call it. And the appearance is very refined uh, and you also see a lot of screwed gold chaton on these watches with large numbers of blued screws and these are things which are seen on Swiss movements, but they tend to be used more sparingly, where German movements tend to use these gold chetons around jewels, usually anchored by two or three screws, far more readily on their movements. The appearance isn't necessarily better, but it's simply different and thoroughly beautiful. Another aspect to consider is the fact that all movements tend to be of the same grade within these German brands. This isn't true of Nomos, for instance, where their top-of-the-line models are distinctly different. But for a lot of brands operating within this luxury segment, with their entire range within this segment, the finishing on the whole range is the same. And there are pros and cons to this. Um, the pros being that, of course, you can enjoy a level of finishing at an affordable price, which you simply wouldn't at a higher price. The, the con being that it's an expensive way of doing things and isn't always to the brand's um, best interest, in the brand's best interest, where that's concerned. And the way that Patek Philippe Nautiluses, for example, sell, bearing in mind they have a lesser movement to some watches from the Patek line, which cost as much, or if not less, than the resale value of such a watch, means that actually, to, to the vast majority of buyers, it doesn't matter that the finishing isn't as good. And so you could argue that it's not worth it on, from the brand's perspective. Of course, there's no real answer to this, but it is a truth within German watchmaking. Japanese top-of-the-line movements are much rarer than their equivalents and counterparts from Germany and Switzerland. And this is largely down to the fact there are so few manufacturers in Japan which actually operate within these realms. Of course, there are independents like Hajime Aosaka, who makes some incredible pieces. But the truth is that the vast majority of these movements are made by Seiko in some form, whether they're Grand Seiko, Seiko, or indeed Credor. These are all produced by the same studio, uh, the Micro Artist Studio within Seiko, and they're some of the most stunning pieces uh, currently available. Now, just because these are the most statistically important doesn't mean that in the future we won't see these small manufacturers in Japan redefining what a top-of-the-range Japanese movement is. But for now, this is very much the, the way they approach things. It's a very clean approach, very, very simple, very, very delicate in terms of having fine finishes. Now these aren't necessarily stripes across the movement, but very often it's simply an exquisite level of graining, uh, which is a brushed surface over the surface of the movement, which gives a very clean aesthetic and also offsets the, the, uh, the anglage, the beveling which they put on these movements. Now it's rare to see a Japanese movement provide you with anglage and beveling of the same standard as a European counterpart, but at the top of the range they really do do it. Much like the Swiss, these manufacturers are also very keen to show the amount of beveling and anglage they can provide. And they do so by adding cutouts to the movement, whether it's on the case back or indeed on the front of the movement in some cases with some skeletonized examples. 
And I think this approach is, of course, trying to appeal to a broad audience, those who are familiar with European watchmaking, but also want to look at Japanese watchmaking. And so you get this interesting hybrid, which is always supremely elegant. And they do add some embellishment in terms of details. And by this, I mean details like, for instance, the addition of cutouts to the mainspring barrel to be able to see it discharging, the addition of, for example, power reserve indicators on the case back rather than the dial to not clutter the dial, but still to provide you with that function whilst winding the watch. Technologically, there's a very similar approach to trying to always innovate. Now, of course, there isn't innovation with every piece, but you do see new versions of spring drive coming out with some of these pieces, adjustments to it, uh, new variations on it. And of course, the automatic watches released at this price range are, are of an incredible standard. The best example of this really is the new generation of Grand Seiko automatic movements with their own low, low resistance and low friction escapement, the sort of Japanese equivalent to coaxial, integrated within the movement, and an appearance which is uncharacteristically ornate, an appearance which shows that Japan is perhaps moving towards a European appearance, in the sense that these new movements have a balanced bridge instead of a balanced cog. They have much broader um, decoration across the whole of the movement with a lot more broad blued screws, and an appearance which is more akin to something you might see from JLC rather than Grand Seiko of old. Of course, only time will tell whether this becomes the predominant appearance of Japanese movements, but it's certainly very interesting to see that they're considering this direction. Of course, at the centre of this is accuracy. Complications don't tend to be that popular with these watches, with really no equivalent to the perpetual calendars and chronographs you see from Switzerland and Germany. Instead, these watches are supremely accurate and made to very, very fine tolerances, that being the demonstration of quality from these brands. But tell me in the comment section below what you think of these different approaches and which approach you can connect most to, whether it's the German approach, the Swiss approach or the Japanese approach. These are fundamentally different, but the quality of manufacturing is phenomenal in all three countries at whatever price range you look at. But they are very different philosophies and very different approaches, so do tell me what you think. Of course, if you enjoyed this podcast, then do follow us or like, share and subscribe, depending upon which platform you're listening to this on. And remember to head over to our website to catch all the latest podcasts, videos and articles. So thank you very much for listening. This is Armand from WatchChronicle.com. Out.